Right, so um, I currently work for Swansea Council's nature conservation team. Um, outdoor learning is, is part of my remit, but I've worked for 30 years um, in outdoor learning in England and Wales, um, 10 of that managing residential centres. I've worked for local authorities, I've worked for the charitable sector. I also have my own sort of freelance business as well doing this stuff. Um, and I'm passionate about outdoor learning. And, and why? Well, I'd like to start with this quote um, from Joseph Cornell, um, one of the American sort of um, founders almost of outdoor learning, and who said, to create a society that truly loves and reveres the natural world, we must offer its citizens life-changing experiences in nature. If, for loves and reveres, you say values and life-changing could also be life-enhancing, you're talking about well-being and its value to people and so on. So, in theory, why is this important? Well, if we can give people positive experiences in nature, that increases their well-being. The evidence is there. I'm not going to quote any more of it because you've heard plenty. Um, hopefully that leads to them valuing nature and hopefully, because surely in the end this is what we need, if anything is going to change, that leads to positive behaviour changes in terms of the way we live. Um, but I'm more and more convinced as well that this positive experience in nature and this valuing nature, very often it's the little things that people value. I'm not sure that um, what really attracts people to nature is the, flat, the fact of the, uh, you know, the ecosystem services, flood attenuation and all that sort of stuff. It's important, don't get me wrong, but it's kind of abstract. People value nature, they value the little woodland where they walk their dog, they value the tree they climb on the way in from school, they value the blue tits that come back every year to their garden. That's the sort of stuff that is actually life enhancing for people. Um, and it's about how do we get people connected in that way that then may lead on to the sort of the greater things. Another of my favourite quotes, I'm a big fan of quotes, um, from Barry Lopez, um, an American nature writer and scientist, ecologist. Um, the quickest door to open in the woods for a child is the one that leads to the smallest room by knowing the name each thing is called. Yeah? Um, the door that leads to the cathedral is the one we want to take them through. Yeah? Basically, as time goes on, I've kind of begun to realise that with outdoor learning, it's actually not really about what we teach them and the knowledge and content and facts they learn about nature. It's important, but I think more important is the emotional experience they have when they're out and when we're engaging them with nature. Basically, does it make them feel good or not? Because if it doesn't, it's probably not worth it. So, um, Tony Thomas, director of the Field Studies Council, who I worked with for many years, re used to refer to this that, as the sense of awe and wonder about nature. So, Joseph Cornell said, we have to give them life exchanging experiences. Who is this we? Parents, teachers, the government, public sector, private sector. Who is it who's going to facilitate, if you like, these life changing or life enhancing experiences and how? Because that needs people, it needs facilitators, mentors, guides who can open that door to the cathedral, who can really get people engaged with nature. Uh, and for the want of a better word, I'm calling them outdoor learning practitioners. So, get a bit more factual. What is outdoor learning? I'm not going to read through all of these, but um, the Institute for Outdoor Learning regards it as any purposeful and planned experiences in the outdoors, including discovery, experimentation, learning about, connecting to, engaging in sports and adventure activities. The Wales Council for Outdoor Learning is about to launch um, its best practice guide, high quality outdoor learning for Wales in the next few months, hopefully. Um, again, it talks about an approach to learning involving being outdoors, um, vehicle for transforming experience, contributing towards culture, etc. Um, a lot of terminology here that is very synonymous with the Wellbeing Goals and the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. If we look at the benefits of outdoor learning, and again, I'm not quoting any evidence, it's all there if people want to research it. Um, I can send links to all that. I, you know, we've seen some fantastic figures and things in earlier talks. 
But we know from uh, hard evidence that outdoor learning benefits pupil attainment, benefits engagement with learning and attendance levels in pupils. It ups levels of physical activity, it develops interpersonal relationships, it develops connection to nature, it develops intellectual, emotional, social, spiritual development of young people and I'm including everybody here because outdoor learning isn't just about schools, it's about everybody who we engage with the outdoors. Um, it develops self-esteem, emotional well-being, resilience, um, it develops relationships with and responsibilities towards the community and values about sustainable use of the environment. Okay, so it does all this stuff. It's truly a multiple benefit activity. Um, what a lot of us are, have been thinking about, I guess, in the outdoor learning community is how do we maximise that benefit? Okay, and again, from the Wales Council for Outdoor Learning, to maximise the positive impact that outdoor experiences have, people need access to frequent, continual, progressive experiences. Okay, uh, and my little table there is just, you know, um, it's about how long you spend outdoors doing stuff and where you do it, and it could be anything from, you know, an hour in the school grounds to week-long intensive residentials in wilderness settings and everything in between. And the argument is that actually people need all of that and they need it at the right and appropriate stage of their development through school and beyond. A couple of years ago, Andy Middleton spoke at this um, conference when he was in Bangor, and uh, he um, founded and ran um, TYF Adventure in, in um, Pembrokeshire. And I remember him saying, we like to see TYF as a dating agency for nature. And just to extend that metaphor a little bit, the problem is with outdoor learning, too much of it is a one night stand. It's, you know, children get to go on a day trip from school once a year, if they're lucky in many cases, or maybe if they're really lucky, they get the holiday romance, yeah of a residential trip for a week. And these can be incredible life-enhancing experiences, but then they go back to school and that's it. Okay, they might not get anything else for another couple of years. And what most people agree is that for outdoor learning to fulfill its potential, we need an ongoing, sustained, and a mutually beneficial relationship to develop with nature, more of a marriage, if you like. So how do we get beyond the first date, I suppose, um, one approach, and again, I'm not going to read all this. This comes from the report from probably the biggest um, outdoor learning project that's been fully evaluated, the Natural Connections Project in the southwest of England, engaged with 125 schools, 40,000 pupils, stacks of teaching staff. And um, what they found there was that... Um, some of the key things about outdoor learning were it needed to be embedded through whole school involvement, there needed to be tailored support for each school, not a one-size-fits-all. It was about enabling schools to do it themselves, yeah? Because with the best will in the world, schools are never going to be able to afford to pay somebody else to come in and do all this for them. Teachers need to be doing it in schools, if we're talking about schools in this instance. Um, but they talked about how important that independent support from the ex you know, the professionals, if you like, was, and about making it low cost and using green spaces within walking distance. And again, all of this ties in with, with the strategic and policy documents that we're all working to. Um, I'd just like to briefly then, as a case study, talk about one of my most recent projects um, called Our Gower. Um, happened over the winter and into spring this year. We worked with four secondary schools from Swansea, mostly inner sw city Swansea. We took groups of pupils, 14, 15 year olds, identified as being at risk of failing in numeracy and literacy. And we decided we're gonna just take them out into the most inspiring landscapes we can on Gower. We're gonna walk them down valleys, through mud, to the beach. Um, we're just going to give them an outdoor experience. We're not going to have any real, you know, we're not there, we're not teaching them about biodiversity. We're not going to have any real curriculum aims other than we wanted to 
find out what their response was to it and get them to do that through writing. So we took poets with us, we took a photographer, and we got the kids to use the technology they like, mobile phones, to record their thoughts and feelings and impressions. Um, really, we wanted to inspire and connect them with nature and also see if this could actually boost their literacy um, levels. This is what the pupils said, and I think what's really telling is the things they picked up and then what they valued. Yeah. It was really fun, but the best part was when we were all drinking hot chocolate together and sharing stories. I got to have fun and get closer to my friends. It wasn't great weather, but the fun brightened up our moods and made us happy, if that's not well-being, what is. Um, we had fun, we learned a lot of new skills. The stuff that they really valued was actually all the well-being stuff and the social stuff and the emotional stuff, yeah? Um, it was a really good experience to have, feel, sense, and see. And this one I particularly love. This was a good experience since I rarely leave my house, yeah? The problem with a lot of our young people that we tend to identify, oh, they're, you know, they sit indoors playing on their screens. That's the uh, impression we sometimes get. But I learned to appreciate nature and the outdoors and made me realize time can be better spent not staring at screens. And what some of the teachers said about improvements in their confidence and resilience. As a teacher, it's been one of the best days in my career to watch my pupils engaged, communicating, exploring, laughing, playing, just enjoying. Um, Watching pupils, when most of them are from deprived backgrounds, being able to just be free to be children. Um, a priceless moment that will stay with me throughout my career, yeah? Nobody's even mentioned any curriculum goals or knowledge or content. It was all the thing that was most valuable was the well-being and the enjoyment and the connection to the nature experience. So, um, what do we need? What does outdoor learning in Wales need if we really want to fulfil its potential to deliver multiple benefits? Um, we need a policy context, we need a higher profile, we need to promote outdoor learning, we need practitioners, people who can do it, we need places to do it, and we need the participants to be engaged with it. How are we doing? I've kind of traffic lighted a bit, and these are my personal viewpoints, I have to make that clear. Okay. I think Wales is the, the place and the time is now for outdoor learning, really. We have the right policy context. We've got the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. We've got a new curriculum coming in, which ties in with the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act in about making our children responsible global citizens, etc. We've got new guidance coming out on best practice in outdoor learning. We've got wellbeing plans. We have the right policy drivers, if you like. Um, does it have a high enough profile? Well. I think it could be higher. I think I'd like to see outdoor learning written in in the future into school inspections. Our well-being, to be fair, is beginning to be, and so on. Is it promoted enough? I think we need to do more. I think outdoor learning needs advocates and champions and ambassadors at all levels from Welsh Government downwards. Um, practitioners mixed bag. We have lots and lots of brilliant outdoor learning practitioners from the private sector, freelance individuals, etc., across from the NGOs in some local authorities um, who, who are able to deliver a whole raft of outdoor experiences to every imaginable audience. Yeah, we have people out there. Um, but on the negative end of that, a lot of local authorities have lost staff in this area, and they've lost the centres and the places they used to deliver stuff. And it was often the local authority staff who were able to have a sort of a wider overview over what was going on in their area and lead on things like networking and partnership working. And, you know, I don't think I'm being, I'm wrong when I say that a lot of that has gone, but the few examples that are surviving are still doing a fantastic job. Um, in terms of places, well, it just goes without saying, Wales is about probably one of the best outdoor classrooms in the world, period. Um, in terms of participants, we have many, many people from the traditional beneficiaries of schools and others, yeah, people with health issues, etc., who could benefit from outdoor learning experiences in the widest possible sense. 
getting people outdoors into nature for those multiple benefits. So I think it's broadly positive with a few areas for improvement. And I think, you know, that's not a bad position to be in so long as it continues to improve and doesn't go any further downwards with more amber and red lights. I'm going to leave not quite the last word, but almost the last word to, um, to a young person. It happens to be my daughter, because as we were driving home last night, I said, Evie, I said, I'm going to need you to go to bed early tonight because I've got some work to do. And she said, oh, what are you doing, Daddy? I said, I'm working on a presentation about um, why outdoor learning is a good thing. And straight away, and no word of a lie, I did not prompt her. She said this, she said, outdoor learning is a good thing because it's fun and you get to communicate with nature and understand it and how you can help save it. Plus, you get to learn lots of new things and it helps communication skills by working in groups to do things. Plus, it gets people away from their iPads and technology. Okay, and that is verbatim as it came out of her mouth and I didn't prompt her for that. Um, she gets it, I think a lot of young people get it and they, they want it, they enjoy and get all these benefits. So if I can be indulged for just, uh, just one minute, um, we started this um, conference with a song, I'm not going to sing, um, and I thought they've upstaged my poem, and then Jack had read a poem this morning, but um, I'm going to finish with a poem by um, Gary Snyder, um, an environmentalist and practicing Buddhist um, from America, um, contemporary of um, Kerouac and Ginsberg and so on. And he wrote this book, Turtle Island, and it won the Pulitzer Prize in 1975. Brilliant book, full of things about the environmental concerns of the time, many of which sadly are still with us and some of them are worse today. Um, but he wrote this poem, and it struck me as being very relevant to the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. It's called For the Children, and um, it gives some words of despair, but also hope. Um, so I'll finish with, finish with this, because I think it, it's kind of apt. So, for the children, the rising hills, the slopes of statistics lie before us, the steep climb of everything going up, up, as we all go down. In the next century, or the one beyond that, they say, there are valleys, pastures, we can meet there in peace, if we make it. To climb these coming crests, one word to you, to you and your children, stay together, learn the flowers, go light. Worth thinking about. Thank you.